podcast hate landlords. It's the Politics Woo! Show podcast. Woo! Lick the landlords. Nice. Lick the landlords. You've got no idea how much that stressed me out having to do that. <laughs> oh, I'm sweating. Um, anyway, we're here to talk about PMQs and we're joined by Sean Hickey, who's now, I guess, a veteran of yeah. the podcast. Well, I was a veteran yesterday. Well, at least a Politics Show. Mm. Yeah, I guess you can say that. And we've also got Rasheen Lanigan, who is an editor at ID. Hi, Which is everyone. Very exciting. How are Thanks you? Thanks for having me on. I'm very good. I'm really sweaty. Are you? But I think it's it's just Irish. Like even in this air conditioned room, I'm sweating. <laughs> How are you? Are you, are you no, I'm good. I'm good. I give I'm sweet. I give Sean my factor fifty at the pub, so yeah. he's, he's fine for these lights. Yeah, just for this. <laughs> We're gonna nice. burn when we come out of here. <laughs> well, I can recover from shouting, and we'll uh, we'll get straight into it. So here's the first clip. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure from the vantage point of his helicopter, everything might look fine. But that's not the lived experience of those on the ground. After 13 years of economic failure across the country, people are paying the price of uncosted, reckless, damaging decisions by the Tory party. And even now, as mortgages go through the roof, the Prime Minister is planning to wave through honours and peerages for those who cause misery for millions. What does it say about this government that while working people are worrying about mortgage hike, paying the bills, even repositions, the Tory party is rewarding those guilty of economic vandalism? Mr Speaker, no amount of personal attacks and petty point scoring can disguise the fact that the honourable gentleman does not have a plan for this country, Mr Speaker. He comes here every week to make the same petty points. We are getting on and delivering for this country. Yes, Mr Speaker, inflation is a challenge. That's why we are on track to keep reducing it. We are reducing waiting lists. We are stopping the boats. All while he is focused on the past, focused on the politics. It's all talk. Whereas from this government and from this Prime Minister, we deliver for the country. A lot to unpack there. (laughs) I think maybe we can start with... Do you think it's petty point scoring? I think it, what's more interesting is that he's like, he comes every week with the same petty point score. And it's just like, maybe like week to week, try to address it. And then mm. maybe he won't come back with the same petty point score. And I don't think it actually is. I think the clip cut off. But what I was, because I watched this on my phone while I was eating lunch. And I was so confused by Rishi Sunak's answer that I was like, is this like a different clip from like a different part of PMQ? So he was like, he comes to see him petty point score and we're stopping the boats. And it was like, but he was, but he wasn't talking about that. It's like Kafka-esque. It's not, it's like he can't, he doesn't know how to respond to it. So he'll just reach for this like fantastical things that he's supposedly doing rather than addressing like actual domestic issues, which I don't think are petty point scoring mm. well the argument is as well i'm gonna be i have to be ollie today so i have to be like that horrible devil's advocate the <laughs> argument is that um stopping the boats would mean that there is you know less demand on a limited supply of housing i mean what would you say to those sort of comments well i mean because the migrants are coming here and buying three bed semi-detached houses and renting where? them out and renting them out right <laughs> it just it, it the the answer to the question doesn't add up Right, it's mortgage rates are rising for people. Inflation is staying where it was, but not going down. Um, and the answer is, well, it's those guys coming across the channel. It's it, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but know. do you think people are buying it? I think they're in a really dangerous position where, I mean, the Tories are in a really dangerous position where previously it was like, okay, well, you know, they, they've proven they don't care about renters, they don't care about private renters, they don't care about people in, you know, social housing, but at least they're the party of like homeowners, like they can support homeowners. And if you've, you know, managed to buy yourself a house and you've pulled yourself off your bootstraps, like they'll be the party for you. And now they're in a really scary dangerous position where like that's proven to not be the case. The points that they're attacking them on now are like, okay, well, what are you going to do about mortgages? Which is a dangerous area for them because that's always been, you know, like their comfort zone. It's like, well, stop the boats and also you'll be fine if you own a house. And no, that's not the case, is it? Yeah, well, I mean, we're going after the asset class now, right? There was a clip that really pissed me off actually the other day, which was a commentator who I actually really like, but they were talking about how um, it's not fair that this you know variable mortgage rate is affecting house uh, homeowners and the government should step in and help them. And as a renter and as someone who writes about renting, you know, t- endlessly, 
it's frustrating that only when the asset class becomes unstable, we start paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it's e even the question from Keir Starmer today was about homeowners, right? It wasn't about the people at the very bottom of it. So you own, an, you own a home, you might live in that home, but there are people that he's defending that are landlords, mm -hmm. right? So he's forgetting about a hefty portion of the electorate who are who are the last rung of the ladder in how these it, it, these rate rises are affecting the general public. Is there something uh, about maybe like the aspiration class? Is there something like that in there where it's like we might be renting at the moment, but we kind of have these aspirations to own a home. And at the moment, the situation is so bleak that there's no possibility for that at all. I, I think you're right, but I think it's more the the weird twist in it is that pre, it was very it used to be very aspirational it was like you know like one day i'll stop rent and one day i'll be able to own a home maybe i'll do like shared ownership maybe i'll do help to buy it's like okay you can do that and now even the homeowners are being shafted so like what what's the point what are you aspiring to here like how can you get out of like the rental rat race because are you just going on to the mortgage rat race like i saw someone point out the other day that owning a house used to be seen as like a kind of freedom and now it's like well you're just renting from the bank yeah, and they sort of and you're just renting from the bank for your entire life well that's like, what rishi said at some point today i don't know if it's a clip that we're going to look at but he mentioned in i think stammer's second or third question on um mortgage holders that the government are working to extend mortgage um What's it called? Like the length of time that a mortgage lasts for to 30, 40 years. Oh, that's um, extraordinary. Yeah. Yes, I saw so about that. So it's like, yeah, 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 don't worry. You you will still be able to pay this, but you will never not be in a position where you're yeah. not paying it anymore. And that's where I you said know? that. I mean, that you are literally renting from the bank yeah. for the yeah. rest yeah. of your life. I mean, I guess mm -hmm. that the, the difference there is like, for me, owning a house was like, okay, well, you know, you'll still be paying every month, but you can't have someone turn around. You can't have some like 25 year old that you've never met turn around and be like, actually, like you have to leave now. Yeah. But like, so that was always what appealed to me about it. It was like, okay, well, you know that you can stay here and you can paint the walls and you can do whatever you want to. Mm. But if you're, if you're paying your mortgage until you die, mm -hmm. then you're still kind of, it's not really yours. It's like higher purchase housing. It's yeah, no, definitely. Bizarre. And shared ownership as well. Like shared ownership is probably one of the biggest frauds that we've yeah. unleashed on young people. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary that you can put all of your life savings, everything that you've managed to accumulate into owning a portion of a house. I mean, even when you get to say you, you pay if it off. Lucky. If mm -hmm. you're lucky. If you're lucky. If you were to pay it off, your equity in that is so nominal. It It's not even, it might just about be enough to put a normal deposit in yeah. on a house that you can borrow from the bank. Just if you can ever leave that, because you know, you get into shared ownership and then like two years down the line, I know a few people who've done shared ownership like as a single person or when they've started going out with someone and then two years down the line, they're like, oh, we might want to have a child, but we live on the 50th floor of this like block of flats and we've lived here for two years, but we can't sell it because we don't own it. And it's got cladding on it. Yeah, and, and, and it's got cladding on it. So mm. they can't, and they, you can't rent it out if you wanted to join the landlord class, which no one really wants to do. But if you wanted to do that, you can't because you don't own it in a way. And you have to like, I have a little dog. Like if I wanted to buy one of these houses, they're like, no pets. It's like, well, That's hang on. That's the biggest thing that pisses me off so much. Right, like, it's like, it's my house. Mm -hmm. If I want my tiny pug to be running around it, like, let me have that. <laughs> Living in that kind of, you know, it's always billed for renters that you've got this freedom and you kind of live this incredible nomad lifestyle mm -hmm. where you can pick up and pack up and go, you know, wherever you'd like to. No one ever talks about the furniture that you have to accumulate because landlords don't furnish the house. I'm not saying they should have to, but you know, you have to accumulate furniture. And you also have to live by ridiculous rules, which is like, if they decide that they don't want to have you, you to have parties there, you have to abide yeah. by that. If you if they don't want you to have a pet, you have to abide by that. If you don't like the color on the walls, well, tough luck. Mm -hmm. And if there's rats in the building, I'm sorry, but if you put anything other than steel wool or a Brillo pad in that hole, yeah. we're charging you for it. You get charged for like trying to make it nicer, essentially. I think the the thing that always like really like annoys me, but I find it like funny in a dark way is when I moved here and when I started renting like on every rental like you know like advert they'll be like no this like no parties or whatever and they'll say no pets sorry so like mm. no pets parentheses sorry and then underneath like no DSS so it's like if you have a cat or a dog like we're sorry but if you're on the dole like we're not sorry you cannot have this house mm. but you know what else <laughs> made me laugh the other day actually thinking about this just reminded me 
a picture went viral on Twitter because someone had moved into a new build area, like a like a bar at home situation. And they'd put up a sign saying no ball games. And <laughs> middle class Twitter like erupted going like, how can you tell them that? It's like, what? Where am what I you... supposed to play cricket now? <laughs> yeah. It's like, if you never, ste- I guess they haven't, but you've never stepped foot on like, why well, can't you speak for London, but on a London council estate? No, like any, like... any estate or like, I, there was <laughs> the estate like beside my house. I remember they had the sign that said no ball games and then they had one beside it. And I never, ever thought it was weird until my friends came over to visit and said, TV licensed men beware. <laughs> That's funny. And they were like, what do they mean by that? And I was like, it means they can't come here. <laughs> but also no ball games, but also no TV license. No ball games with the TV license yeah, people. Yeah, 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 you can't, you can't because play we're football against them. Yeah, yeah. Demonize yeah. the TV license people. Yeah, they should. They deserve it. <laughs> should we do another clip? It's 2,900 pounds extra. That's the cost to the average family of the Tory mortgage penalty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now he was warned by experts about this as long ago as autumn last year, but he either didn't get it didn't believe it or didn't care, because he certainly didn't do anything. And when I raised this a couple of months ago, he had the gall to stand at that dispatch box and say he was delivering for homeowners. How is an extra £2,900 a year on repayment delivering for homeowners? Well, so, Mr Speaker, now, let's just just look at the facts. Let's look at the facts, because he talks about interest rates. He talks about interest rates. Perhaps your gentleman could explain why interest rates are at similar levels in the United States, in Canada, in Australia and New Zealand. Why they're at the highest level in Europe that they've been for two decades, Mr Speaker. That's why it's important that we have a plan to reduce inflation. But in contrast, what do we hear from the Honourable Gentleman? He wants to borrow an extra £28 billion a year. That would make the situation worse. He wants to ban new supplies of energy from the North Sea. That would make the situation worse. And, and he wants to give in to unions unaffordable pay demands. That would make the situation worse. Mr Speaker, he doesn't have many policies. But the few that he does have all have the same thing in common. They're dangerous, inflationary, and working people would pay the price. So he doesn't have policies, but he does have policies, but he doesn't like the policies. And also, apparently, he's going to give in to the union. Yeah, so it's like placing, <laughs> placing nice policies on Keir Starmer. <laughs> It's like he, it is like he's the never worst person you know just made a great point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, he's going to do that. Oh, no. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the nurses like flock to him. <laughs> um, it's very Osborne actually. Very Osborne. What he had to say. It's like defending the austerity policies. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, kind of giving the whole the big the big Cameron cheese. I mean, were... the, the difference there is about a decade. That yeah. they're like, <laughs> he's like, no, changed? no, it, guys, it will work. Promise. Like, just give me like another year. I promise it'll work. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he was out over the weekend, actually, Osborne. Did you see that? He was out yesterday, wasn't he? Oh, was it yesterday? Yeah, we just had the COVID inquiry yesterday. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I've been off with grief, Sean. So I'm sorry <laughs> that my dates don't align. <laughs> it all just blends into one. Um, so he was that. He was there. He was saying, he was defending the austerity measures, mm. um, which is bizarre because, well, 120,000 mm. people died. Yeah. Well, it's like he basically echoed what Cameron said on Monday or Tuesday. I can't remember which day it was. Uh, Well, it would have been Monday if it was yesterday that Mm. he was at the COVID inquiry, where Cameron basically said, well, actually, austerity meant that we could handle the pandemic better. You know, so you should actually thank us for what damage we've done to the economy. Um, Did you feel that? I mean, did he explain that or was he just like, we should thank us? I Don't didn't watch ask Osborne. me anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, no, no. That's the only line. Thank That's me, but it. don't ask yeah. me about it. No further comment. <laughs> How weird was it? He went straight into that job at the Evening Standard. I know. It's and just... but like, no one really talks about that anymore. Oh. And we should. Yeah, let's bring it up more. We should. We should get talk him on about the podcast? Lebedev as well. <laughs> we should get Lebedev on the podcast. He would be a great guest. He would be. Mm. You're in the middle. Osborne, Lebedev. Mm. Mm. I think Lebedev would need to go in the middle because it's sort of like the holy trinity. So I actually think what Rishi did today was extremely clever. And that's obviously been written by someone who's very online and way above their pay grade because that is tapping into every single fear that a potential Tory turned Labour voter might have mm-hmm. about the new, you know, bringing in the Labour Party. Mm. It's, I mean, like it, it, you go up and down constituencies, you talk to people and you go, look, I... The Conservatives have absolutely no stewardship over the economy. They've got no control over what they're doing. But can I trust Keir Starmer when he might just spend what I have less? 
left. I know what you mean, and I, I've, I've got in a really weird position here where I'm defending Keir Starmer, which I promise you has never happened before in my Liar. life. She's going to defend the Queen <laughs> never, in a never. Well. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I love the monarchy. Uh, please don't put that on. <laughs> um, but like, the problem I have with this is that the, the figures that Keir is using are like actual figures that you can conceive in your head. You're like £2,900 a year more. Like that's something that I I know, like when I look at my bank account, how that would affect me over a year. £28 billion, it's like, it's so fantastical. It's like the boats thing. It's like, I can't really conceive of it in my real day-to-day -day life. So it sounds very impressive, but like, what does it actually mean? Like mm. when I go to the shop, I can see how much butter or oat lattes cost me compared to last week. Like... Coke Zero, 170 versus 155. I know how that's going to fit into my 2,900 pound extra. Yeah. 28 billion, it's like, it's. I know what you're saying, that if you're a, like a voter that's on the fence, that this could be convincing. But for me, it's more convincing that Keir Starmer is saying like, okay, over the next 12 months, this is what this is going to cost you if you keep this guy in. I was quite impressed by actually, there was a woman from JP Morgan who's one of Jeremy Hunt's advisors like informal you know like people in the market just kind of inform the chancellor about what's going on about things and she was on radio 4 this morning and she was saying that the bank of england are basically acting like we're already in a recession and the best course of action would be if people start essentially panicking that they might lose their jobs mm. because then they won't ask for a pay rise and that will quash any inflationary fears that we you know we might have we will quash, sorry it will quash inflation now, I thought that was funny because Rishi Sunak did a big stand up today. Did you hear this? Where he said, we are not in a recession. Which is, mm. that's what you want. <laughs> Nobody panic. Yeah. We are not in a recession. And that's why I'm it's saying this. It's all fine. It's so all you've fine. Got, like, you've got like the Bank of England and one of the Chancellor's advisors going like, it's so great we're in recession because mm. everyone's calming down inflation. And or Rishi didn't Sunak's she say like... that they need to force one? <laughs> right. Is that yeah. what it was? Yeah, but they need was... to force a recession yeah. to kind of, to steady the boat in mm -hmm. a way. Was like... If not you stop continue, not stop them. No, well, they are. It. They are doing that Steadiest. anyway, guys. Mm. Don't panic. Um, <laughs> we need to send inflation to Rwanda. That is a sick idea. I <laughs> think. I mean, don't put that out there because he'll take that and use that next week. Oh yeah, he might actually. He might do. do you know that actually reminds me? Okay, so one time. Are you going to say that you influenced Tory policy? No, I that... did. I did. So I'm in a green room and I, I'm going onto a panel and I say to this, this backbench Tory MP, like Gary Glitter. Now I'm laughing and I'm saying Gary Glitter. Jesus Christ. Well, this is the podcast that hates nonsense. Yes. Can't laugh like Gary anyway, Glitter. I'm laughing at, you know, him being back inside. Um, <laughs> anyway, so it's like on screen that he's going back in because he's like, you know, failed his bail or whatever. And I say to this Tory MP and I was like, you know what? You could win the next election on. If death are, penalty. Yes. One <laughs> no. policy. Death penalty. I don't think you don't, you don't want to go on the internet being like, I support. Is that what you want? No, because I said <laughs> I said that kind of like a just sort of like off the cuff, like, you know, like this is absolutely mental. And like, you know, but Gary what Glitter, this has what now become is Ava supports the death penalty. Look, listen, I just, just so you know. <laughs> it was a nudge. It was a nudge. A it nudge was... towards the death penalty. Anyway, he a said it on the panel. One. He said it on the panel. And the advisor was back in the green room, like rocking back and forward, like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Very no! much. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, should we do another clip? <laughs> <laughs> on that note. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my right honourable friend for all he has done for people in Rosendale and Darwin to help them through this cost of living crisis. <laughs> but people are very concerned with what is being described as the mortgage bomb about to go off. Is now the time for him to look at reintroducing a bold Conservative idea of mortgage interest relief at source? Because if we don't help families now, all the other money that we spent to help them have, will have been wasted if they lose their home. Chancellor. Well, no one could have a, a more doughty champion in Rossendale and Darwin than my right honourable friend. And I listened to what he says carefully. Um, but I think he will understand that those kind of schemes, which involve injecting large amounts of cash into the economy, right now will be inflationary. So much as we sympathise with the difficulties, and we'll do everything we can to help people seeing their mortgage costs go up, we won't do anything that would mean we prolonged inflation. It's quite funny, isn't it? Because, wasn't it, 2016 figures said that he had four rental properties. Mm. So a guy that's looking for mortgage support for homeowners already has four mortgage support <laughs> look after me rishi yeah, yeah. look after me yeah but it must be quite tough 
if, if you have, I don't know what his mortgage situation is, but if you've got four buy-to-let properties and they're all on variable interest, like, yeah. that's going to be a lot expensive. of plates is Jake Berry. That's yeah. four too many buy-to-let properties. Yeah. <laughs> that's really going to be, uh, that's going to be limiting <laughs> the cash return. But it's also funny given that what Sunak was saying today about what Keir is going to be spending money on, right? So 28 billion for renewables, giving into the unions. <laughs> I mean, I welcome Keir taking a policy turn to <laughs> give into the unions. But in the same in the same kind of criticizing that kind of fiscal policy to then turn around and say, anybody who owns a home should have all of the benefits that the state has mm. to offer to keep them in assets, mm. but everyone else can fuck themselves, basically, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Every single argument that is used against rent controls is somehow being used for a mortgage <laughs> safety net, mm -hmm. which I just don't understand because the whole argument about rent controls, and this has not been explained to me by economists, this has been explained to me by Tory at least. <laughs> who explained to me very graciously that, well, we can put caps on rent, but listen, when we lift those caps, they're gonna put it right back up. It's like, what do you think the banks are gonna do? <laughs> like, the banks are gonna go, oh God, we really have to suck up some of this profit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like at the end of that fixed term, you're gonna go, right guys, the variable interest rate back up, mm -hmm. yeah. obviously. I guess that the, the thing with rent controls, like if you then, well, if you have mortgage controls, which is what he's arguing for, my worry is that it's not going to filter in to what I think would be presumed to be like rent controls by virtue of that. Like, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but certainly with me, it's happened to me and it's happened to my friends that their landlords have come to them and been like, my mortgage has gone up. And so as a result of that, your rent is going up mm -hmm. because you're subsidizing my mortgage. Mm -hmm. So like, it seems like the unspoken thing in this is like, if you cap, if you bring in controls for mortgages, we will then not have to, you know, like our per buy to let my four tenants will not have to pay more rent. Mm. But I just don't trust it. I think they could bring in mortgage controls and your rent would still go up. Like yeah. once a year, they would just turn around and be like, oh, I've just decided well, yeah, to why would it not? Pound right? Why, why like, would they not? If, if they're just, they're sitting pretty on what they were on, or what they were paying already, and then they could say, oh, fantastic. Yeah. I can pass that on to my tenant. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. not gonna happen. And know? it's never, you know, those prices never come back down again. There's no incentive no. to bring them back down unless you suddenly have like a new influx of supply, which if we look, you know, if we glance at the house yeah. building figures that that's not coming. I mean, just look at how much you pay for pasta at the moment, right? If you're if you're buying pasta now for say one pound fifty for a pack of spaghetti, there is no incentive for supermarkets to bring that back down when you know inflation goes, mm -hmm. you know, inflation eases, which is also con contradictory because inflation yeah. doesn't ease until they bring those prices back down. Well, I think it's like the only difference you would realize if inflation actually impacted all of our wages, which is the only time that inflation hasn't. Like, mm. Wages have stayed the same. Everything else has gone up. Mm -hmm. But I think like with regards to like rent and mortgage inflation, like even like two or three years ago, this was more of an unspoken thing. Like everyone knew that they were subsidizing their landlord's mortgage, but it was, you know, you didn't actually look into it as much. Whereas now landlords, because of this mortgage bomb that's about to go off, they're so much more open about it. Like mm -hmm. I, I am actually in a weird time now where I like my landlord. <laughs> he's Irish, I'm oh, Irish. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have this weird parasocial relationship where he's just like, okay, I'm gonna help you. But he <laughs> he sort of emailed me and was like, look, my mortgage is going up, so the rent has to go up. And then I was sort of put in a position where I was like, well, I'm really sorry that your mortgage is going up. Of how course can I, I will give you more money. Like, yeah. you know, how can I help with this? But like, that is, it wouldn't have been information provided by like Foxton's before. They'd just been like, sorry, you have to pay more. Mm. Whereas now this whole conversation is swirling in the background so everyone can be very open about the fact that I'm paying someone else's mortgage. Mm. I mean, I think we need to have quite a radical rethink about how we do housing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of lost on a lot. Of, it's lost on anyone who's not a renter that housing should be a right not a privilege and mm -hmm. housing it shouldn't be viewed as a commodity, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But that's if you have if you have people in in the House of Commons that have openly like four or five buy to let properties, like of course that's gonna filter down that we see it as a commodity. I don't think anyone should have four or five properties. Like you know, no one needs that amount of housing. Mm. And when you look at like their housing targets, like on the surface level, they're not like 
you kind of look at it and if you're glancing, you're like, oh, they've not messed up by much. You know, they want to build 300,000 houses a year and they've built 2,500,000 houses a year. Well, like that's not much difference until you're wanting one of the 95,000 yeah. houses that are missing. You're well, like, God, it. I can't but find them. I think them. like it's also, it's not necessarily to have, to have public housing stock, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to eradicate landlords. You just need to build houses, yeah. right? Like what you're saying. And you support, basically need the, to... support the businesses that are building those houses. And yeah. not just in London, like we're, you know, kind of all in a bubble here as well that we're like, oh, there's no houses in London. We all have to live in London. It's London prices, but like, it's not just impact in London. Like, especially when you're like, there was this chat on Sky News today about like SMEs and how they're not supported and how if they run out of money in areas specifically like leveling up areas they'll just run out of money and be like okay we'll just you know we can't finish this project so now none of those houses are built and you know that's that's it no definitely I mean it's a problem it's a really big problem in Glasgow Mm. we found that we were actually there to report another story back in August last year and what we actually stumbled upon were these like reams and reams of students like queuing for hours to view one property mm. it was extraordinary and i know that's happening in london and manchester but and, I mean, and in belfast in belfast dublin, uh, well. dublin yeah. yeah i mean i really worry that like we are going to end up in a situation like dublin here where it's fairly normalized to share a bedroom with a stranger oh, God. Mm-hmm. Like, i remember uni. having a chat with ed once and oh. i spoke about room sharing as though it was a normal thing i've never shared (laughs) i've never shared with anybody other than my partner here but i was telling a story about a friend of mine yeah i was like you did look around the room and i was like what's going on it's very progressive here at jim (laughs) i was telling a story about a friend who shares a house or shares a room in a house in dublin not realizing that it isn't a thing here to do mm-hmm. and then I was it left in my head going like, oh well I suppose you'll you'll learn in a year's time or two years time like obviously London has got far more stock than Dublin has probably than Dublin will ever have mm. but if it continues the way it's going where there's just not sufficient housing for the the people that are here you're gonna have a scenario where you're having to split a room between three I mean, four people I mean it's it is mm. happening like you see it on like those Facebook groups where people are like you know submit my room for five hours while i go to big sainsbury's like they're they want people to share rooms and people will do it because they're desperate and Mm. like it's normalized in dublin so if you have people coming up from dublin over to london they're already used to it and then it just kind of like gets worse and worse and worse and people just accept it like people are having slums of irish people in london again Why are you smiling? Because <laughs> we've seen it all before. Yeah. <laughs> you want it. Although the way that I did see this horrifying thing in like Sunday Times Travel a few weeks ago where it was this, this writer that was like, I don't know if anyone's clocked this, but you can be a landlord in Ireland for really cheap. And, the <gasps> house, and I was like, we do not need more English landlords in Ireland. Oh Historically gosh. speaking, this no, has no, not no. turned out well for us. Have you guys not again. Tried it? Like, have you tried I mean, it's over worth there? another go. <laughs> like, why not, let's do it again and see what happens. It's just extraordinary. Our granddaddy did that once. <laughs> <laughs> what, what have we been doing? Let's get over there. <laughs> it's, Ava? it's infuriating. <laughs> no, the, whole, the whole thing is really infuriating. You know, I was listening to a really. He seemed like a nice guy from Zoopla, and he was talking yesterday they about. They always seem like a nice guy. The guys like at nice Zoopla. Guy. They do, well, they've got you know well, these people. They've got a lot of money. They can just kind of relax <laughs> a little bit. But um, no, he seemed nice. He was just talking about how we. He didn't want to discourage good landlords from the market because we're in a situation now, apparently, where rent. <laughs> sorry, renting out your buy to let is becoming unappealing. And so you need to entice Aww. those landlords into <laughs> still wanting to put them onto the market, but houses onto the market. And you know, it's just it's just absolutely extraordinary because it's kind of like, how did we get to a point where supply is so futile and demand as a result has become so high that we're now crawling over to the landlords and saying to them, like, please, please take <laughs> the renters' money, take their salary, yeah. <laughs> otherwise we'll have nothing. But, like, it's just, it's absurd. Like, we are literally being like, won't someone think of the landlords? Mm. Like, mm. <laughs> how have we ended up in this position? <laughs> yeah. I mean, also, you know, we, we, we always brush over rent controls, and I think it's because it's just so infuriating. Mm. But, like, if you look at New York, and New York, in my head, is kind of like the bastion of capitalism, right? It's sort of like, I mean, 
we think that, you know, London City is big. Mm. New York, the capital that is being generated by their banks is absolutely extraordinary. Mm. Now, how is that city managed to maintain rent controls? And yeah. we haven't. But like it is, it, you're right. It is bizarre that in every other aspect, New York is like you're on your own, but rent control is the one thing that they've like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I will say that rent control is like in New York. It's still people have learned how to abuse that system. Like when I, when I lived in New York, we lived with this lady who like kind of like openly hated us, which was interesting. Um, and she was like, it's thirteen hundred dollars a month, and me and the guy lived with her like okay, well, you know, we'll try and find that. Could we have another bed? She was like, no, you can't have another bed. We were like, okay, we'll find a bed on Craigslist for free. Mm. And then one day, like a letter came for her and we realized that she was paying like $400 a month for this flat. Oh my and God. she was and she was renting it out to us for 1300. And then turned around and being like, do you guys, like, do you really need Wi-Fi? Like, does anyone really need Wi-Fi? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. Get yeah, out so amongst it. You're in New York, kid. <laughs> yeah. And she was like, oh, you don't need windows that open. You don't need our con. So there are ways that get around it. People will always abuse the system, but it would be nice to have yeah, a system totally. to try to abuse. However, 1300, <laughs> even if you just had a room, I'm so sorry to say this. I don't yeah. know what time that was, but now it would seem it's quite It's in quite reasonable. a good area as well, yeah. Was it? Yeah. Well, I was in Williamsburg. That's quite I don't reasonable. think you'd get it now. You probably shouldn't have brought your eight cats. And like, <laughs> and and that, yeah, and the Craigslist bear with the bad bugs. And yeah. <laughs> well, oh, fuck God, her. So so <laughs> but it doesn't need to be like this. It didn't need to be like this. Yeah, because mortgage deals in Ireland, they're not sitting in excess of 6%. They're around about 4.5%. Yeah. Inflation in the euro area, that's not sitting at 8.7%, it's sitting at closer to 6%. Britain is broke. Now, seven years after their EU referendum, will he finally admit that it was Brexit that broke it? But, Mr Speaker, again, I don't think the honourable gentleman was paying attention earlier. Interest rates in this country are at similar levels to they are in America, in Canada, in Australia and in New Zealand, Mr Speaker. The rise in inflation and interest rates is a global phenomenon, but that's why early I set out that it was the right economic priority to have to bring inflation down. That's what this government would do. But that requires, Mr Speaker, that requires difficult and responsible decisions. That's what leadership looks like. I don't think the SNP will ever do the same thing. Brexit that broke it is kind of it just gives it more pizzazz in that accent, doesn't mm. it? It's like, yeah. SNP are always great for PMQs, yeah. the, the drama. <laughs> This is it's such a dramatic. It mm. doesn't need to be like this. It didn't need to be like this. <laughs> He's imagining someone writing a dying. <laughs> Can I pick a hole in it? Yes. Please do. I agree with the three premises that it didn't need to be like this. The comparisons to Ireland and the Euro Eurozone, agree mm -hmm. with that. I also agree that it has been seven years after Brexit. <laughs> Indubitably, <right>. yeah. <laughs> I don't. Bang on. I'm not confident that that was the best way to end that bit it it feels like it's too it's too simplistic yeah it, it should just be like oh well it's brexit's fault if we hadn't you know left the european union okay. then everything would be fine and there'd be enough houses and you know everyone could afford their mortgage it's just it's a bit it's a bit like it's blue SMP, though, yeah, isn't yeah, yeah. It? like everything has to come back to something that's their their policy their reason yeah to to want to leave the UK in the first place. You know? Which, you know, is, is what, you know, that's fine. And I mean, like, <laughs> even even the Ireland thing, it's like, yeah, okay, the, the, the interest rates are 4.5%, but good luck finding yeah. a house in the first place. I was right? gonna say, it's like a big, it's, it's big talk to be like, things are better in Ireland for housing. Mm -hmm. Like, if that's your bar, that's pretty bleak. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was talking to a Tory MP a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about inflation, because that's a sort of, hot chat that I like to have you on the parliamentary terrace. MPs. Death penalty, inflation. Would you know what, Sean? That's my fucking job. Like, <laughs> what, the, what the fuck? That's like... <laughs> that's like I never talked to Tory MPs. Yeah, but that's like, sat in the office. <laughs> <laughs> Literally have a lobby pass for that, yeah. <laughs> for that reason. I would draw the comment. I'm not just going out and whoring myself. Well, no, maybe. <laughs> no. Um, she takes no pleasure in it, Sean. No. no. But anyway, this, this conversation I had, basically we were talking about inflation and we were saying, he was saying that under Liz Truss, the conditions were worse than they are at the moment. The economy was, what was sorry, hang on. It was on. about five minutes. Let me just start that again, because I've actually just told it wrong. Sorry, Laura, <laughs> I'm reverting here. 
So what, what we were talking about was under Liz Truss, the economic conditions were better than they are now. And at the moment, it's a lot worse. But conveniently, Liz Truss cocked it up so badly mm. and they were able to use that as a mechanism or a vehicle to get her out because the second that she won the leadership contest, most backbench MPs were saying to each other, she cannot lead us into the next election. We don't want her. And actually her really messing it up mm. um, was fantastic for those who like to play political games. Yeah, so what was it? It was the week and a half before the autumn statement that everything was fantastic and then after that. Well, I think I think what the I, I think that what his point was have I told this already on the podcast? That's really embarrassing if I have maybe I haven't. I don't think so. Um this conversation made a huge effect on you. Yeah. <laughs> you hate those trusts. Well what he was saying was that it was a racial issue. He was saying that the membership would never have voted Rishi in, mm. but Rishi was the natural choice and the natural successor and possibly the only person available at that time who could lead them into a general election. You know, the sort of person who could be trusted with the economy potentially. Mm. But inflation is much worse now. And none of the Tory MPs are coming out the way that they did during this trust to get angry about it because they can't but <laughs> topple I th- Rishi. But I think, like as Sean said, like it was such a short period of time that, like, it's it, again, it's a bit like saying, like, oh, it's Brexit. It's just plucking something and being like, that's what it is. Like mm. to say that it was, oh, it was worse during Liz Truss is a bit like saying, like, things were worse during Mercury no, retrograde. It was during oh, Liz well, Truss. like it's better. You know, this it's like worse. it's such a it's such a finite amount of you know what I mean it's mm. not like a long period of time that yeah. week was fantastic yeah and then Saturn came in and things changed mm-hmm. like. <laughs> I mean I had a good week my rent was already going up <laughs> in, Liz, in Liz Truss era your rent was going up no yeah my went. I when did I move out August that's when my rent was going up mine only went up Rishi Rishi really? era yeah you've got Rishi rent yeah I've got Rishi rent it's great Love what did it. you have I had Boris rent. You actually had quite a good landlord though, didn't you? Yeah, well, my landlord was an investment fund. So I think they just forgot that we were there. That's Up until, that's like, we were there for three years until we got £100 hike in the rent. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it was sweet. Yeah. I think it's just, the, the, there are thousands of properties in this portfolio. And that's what like, you want. Oh, this one at the very bottom with the <laughs> cheapest rent. Let's, let's put that up a little bit I more. mean, Boris rent was... I hate to say it, it was kind of good because it was like COVID rent and the COVID rent was the good. landlord mm-hmm. started to panic and they were like, you know, you stay, stay. Although my landlord during COVID was an absolute bitch and I fucking hated her. Oh, really? like, yeah, she was like, she was the worst landlord I think you can have is someone that's your own age. And I think she was like a year younger than me. Was she mm. Really? She was so rich. I found her on Instagram. She found what school she went to. I became like, you know, when no one could go out, I was like, this is my, this is my thing. <laughs> yeah. For six months, I like look at my landlord's Instagram and I'm like, bitch, you're in Australia. Um, and she, I remember like, she got really concerned about the fact that we were cooking pasta with the lids off and we were what? making her, her, her house damp. Um, and like the, we rented from like, it wasn't Foxons, but like one of those. And one time the property manager like called me and they were like, well, her dad's been on the phone and says that she's crying. And I was like, I'm oh sorry. My oh my God. <laughs> we're all crying. It's a hard time. Did she live there? No, she didn't live there. She, but she how would, did she know what she you would, were doing with but the But she pasta? would sometimes send her posh friends around to be like, I'm taking this lamp. And I was like, okay. <laughs> like, it was bizarre. How can I read? I really want to just like drop her first and last on the podcast, but I won't. <laughs> How mental is that? How did she know what was going on? Do you think she was filming you? I think it's the opposite of what you have. I think it was like her one. So she bought mm. the house, rented it out, pissed off to Australia on. like during COVID. And she was like fixated on us living correctly in this house and like heating it all the time and that sort of thing. I think the ultimate good landlord is someone that, either is an elderly Irish man that likes you yeah. mm. or someone that has thousands of properties and forgets about you. Hypercapitalism is the best environment yeah. to rent with. That's what we've landed on this week. <laughs> I've got an old East London guy. Is he nice? He He's, uh, well, I mean, we're like three days in, but he's, <laughs> he's owned the property. He's got time. They're yeah. always nice at the start. You're like, this is the best landlord no, 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 I've ever I had. I don't know who he is. Oh. I met him like once. He was, but when we were signing for the property and he was just like this old like this old guy who's owned the building forever, converted it Small into flats. Geezer. Yeah, and he's he's so geezer to the point that <laughs> he basically asked me like, there was like five other people competing for it, which is actually quite I hit low. That. Yeah, but it's quite low. Mm. And they were students, and I basically was like, so you were to like, the, fuck you guys. <laughs> yeah, so like to the estate agent who was showing us around, I was just being a right bitch, and I was like, listen, these students 
I get it, their parents are gonna pay the full rent, <laughs> but I work really hard and I'll never pay it late. So can you tell him what? I work really hard? Do you, you ever, do you ever tell that you're a, a journalist? Friend. No. Yeah, see, so I'm just, like one time I did it to, I started emailing, I couldn't get my deposit back. So I switched to my work email. I'm not proud of it, Yeah. but I did get my That's deposit back. That's different though. That's getting your deposit back. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I will take this to small claims court, which I don't even know how to do. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> but I just heard people saying it and I was like, this will be going to the small claims court. Yeah. And then she was like, okay, you can have your money back. Nice. <laughs> we'll call it there. So we've been Sean Hickey. <laughs> yes, we have. This is Rasheen Lanigan and you can read her at ID. And she's also got a book coming out, which is called I Want to Go Home, but I'm already there. So if you enjoyed any <laughs> of the opinions that she spouted on here you should probably go and pre-order it or go and look it up but please also buy it if you did not like my opinions yeah because mm. then you then you can like hate read it yeah and then i can maybe buy a house yeah and you can, <laughs> you can rip dream. it up yeah also just want to give um a mention to my wonderful friend agnes who sadly passed on friday night and uh, she loved this podcast and um i'm gonna miss her forever but that's all thanks for listening <laughs>